Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, you're very, very welcome here to uh, a Grand Challenge lecture here at the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences at uh, Kiel. And uh, this is the first event of the year, and we're delighted that it's uh, such a popular event. You've drawn quite a crowd, Helen. Um, so we're here to, to hear and to interact with uh, Dr. Helen Panker, CBE, who's going to be giving a presentation on a uh, recent book, Deeds Not Words, The Story of Women's Rights uh, Then and Now. And uh, we're delighted to have you uh, give the first lecture of this new academic year. So Helen uh, is an author, a women's rights activist, and an international development practitioner. Uh, she's acknowledged that key influences in her, in, in, on her own interests and career as, as they've developed are uh, two, two things in particular, being born and brought up in Ethiopia and her Pankhurst surname. And she's most proud of the work she's done encouraging linkages between those interested in the suffragettes and those campaigning on women's rights in the present, and also between local UK-based feminism, international development, and global feminism. Helen studied at Sussex University, Vassar College, New York, and Edinburgh University, where she obtained a PhD in social science. She's, also, she's been awarded an honorary degree from Edge Hill University. And as well as having been a visiting senior fellow at LSE, she is currently a visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan University and is the first chancellor of the University of Suffolk. She was awarded a CBE in this year's New Year Honours list for services to gender equality. Helen is a senior advisor for Care International, based in the UK and in Ethiopia. She has worked for a number of international development charities, including WaterAid, Farm Africa, Womankind Worldwide, and Accord. She is currently a trustee of ActionAid, and in 2019, was one of the judges of the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. Alongside these roles, she has also been what she refers to as a custodian of the remembrances about the suffragettes and making them relevant to the present. I'm sure the distinctive surname does, does help, and I don't think you're the only Pankhurst uh, here tonight. Uh, this is a name, of course, synonymous with the leaders of the British suffragette movement, and Helen's own involvement in this has involved writing, public speaking, as tonight, organising and leading action initiatives, uh, and also reenactment work, such as the 2015 film, su film Sub Suffragette, song lyrics with composer Lucy Pankers for Emmeline Anthem, which is commissioned by BBC Radio 3. So these contributions have been vital in keeping the story, the legacy, of the suffragettes relevant to politics today, to power relations, to analysis of gender equality and activism in that area. So I'm sure you're all looking forward to this participatory discussion. So the Q&A isn't going to follow at the end, really. It's going to be wrapped into the interactive presentation that, ha that Helen is going to do. Uh, and after the session, she will be on hand to sign copies of her book and the title of the presentation. Deeds Not Words, The Story of Women's Rights Then and Now, published last year. Just one final uh, word. I should have mentioned some, some housekeeping at the start. There are toilets in the reception area, which you would have come in uh, past the reception area. If there is a fire alarm, it does mean we do have to evacuate the building, and the nearest fire exit is at the back, and we are uh, to assemble at the Italianate Gardens at the, at the back of Keel Hall. Um, and one final thing. Uh, because it's an interactive session and the, se the whole session is being recorded, uh, you, won't be, you won't be recorded by the camera, but your voice would be heard. If you have any objection to that being, being used, could you please raise it with Steve, who's standing at the back at the moment. Just raise that at the, at the end of the session and we'll make sure that the editing takes, takes care of that. Uh, okay, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Helen Pankers to Keel. Thanks, everybody. Really delighted to be here. Um, quite a long intro about my life. I saw it kind of flashing behind, in front of me and behind me. Um, 
And yes, I'd like to do this as interactively as possible. You might also have heard that there are a few other Pankhursts. There's a family of Pankhursts I've never met before, I've just met right now, who are related to Emmeline's uh, husband's grandfather, correct? More or less. Um, so uh, the way I'd like to do this is in three parts. The first part is to talk a bit about suffrage, suffragettes, that family legacy, uh, why we're still interested in them, um, what does it mean, etc. And, and the way I'll do that is I'll make a few points and then open it up for any questions you might have on that. And then the second bit is to explore how far we think we've got in the last 100 years and to do so thematically. So I'll pick up a few themes. Uh, I'm using the structure of my book, so we could look at politics if we can bear to. Um, we could look at economics, uh, women's identity, violence against women, culture, power. Not all of those, but I'll pick up some of those. And again, I'll make a few points and then hope to hear from you, hope to actually get you to score a little bit. Um, because in the book, I score each chapter between zero and five. And the re reason I do that is I'm quite interested to see whether we think we've done better in some parts of women's lives than other. And then when you have an audience like this, you often have different uh, opinions and different scores. So then we can pick up the differences and see a little bit what you're thinking in this particular audience at Keele University today. And then at the very end, and I promise you we'll do this all in one hour, at the very end, just a few minutes to say, OK, this is our analysis of um, where we've, how far we've got. Where do we think the focus is going forward? And I'll share with you some of my favourite quotes, both from the book and from having given talks like this up and down the country, um, and then ask you to turn to your neighbour and in buzz groups just discuss amongst yourselves to see what points you think are the most important, and then we'll come back together at the very end and just pick up some of your thoughts um, in that way. How does that sound? Are we happy for it? Yeah? Okay. Great. Okay, so, um, firstly... How many of you in your own families have heard that narrative that it's particularly important that women vote because of the sacrifices of the suffragettes in the previous time? Hands up if that's your case. Look around you, by the way, if you can, and see how many hands are going up. And that's absolutely fabulous, because what that means is that narrative, that national narrative about how important the vote is and how important the continuation of that heritage is something that is absorbed in so many families. For those of you who put your hands up, fabulous. For those of you who didn't, please make it part of your family's narrative. Uh, let it be, you know, something that is discussed in all families. And it is a fascinating story. Why on earth would you not talk about it? What was right? How did they do it? What would they do? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, hands up those of you who've seen the film Suffragette. Um, about the same number, I would say. Uh, possibly the same people. Um, we could talk about that as well if you are interested. Those of you who put your hands up, um, as you heard, I was in it, I advised. My main contribution was um, at the end, you get the dates of when women got the vote in different countries. And that was my recommendation because I thought that both universalized the story and also brought it to the present. Um, my daughter beats me actually because she had one contribution which was hello, whereas I don't say anything in the film. <laughs> Um, also, interesting, I don't know whether most of you saw it when it first came out, but since then, Me Too has happened. And for those of you who've seen the film, the political um, arc of Maud, the key character, starts through violence in the workplace. And I think that's quite telling about the fact that more than, more than 100 years later, there are still similar narratives that are going on. Um, the reason that suffrage is so important is that it is the beginning, it's the first wave of feminism. It's the first time that women come together at the core, at the centre of a narrative with men in support. But it's about women, it's about women's story, it's about women's history. So it's vitally important in terms of that sense of solidarity. Women coming together north, south, east, west of the country, every part of the UK engaging one way or another. Young women campaigning t next to older one, different classes, different backgrounds. Um, for the first time, that sense of being a woman and it being important and challenging what society was saying that women could be. So the first thing I wanted to say is it's about that solidarity, that sisterhood, which is new in history, you know, in terms of the extent to which that was felt. But whenever you bring women together, whenever you bring any cause together through that sense of solidarity, very quickly differences occur. 
So my second point is that that's what happens. So you have not just differences between the suffragists and the suffragettes, suffragettes formed by Emmeline Pankhurst at home, not too far from here in Manchester, well, you know, not too far, you know, um, depending on what your scale is, um, formed in 1903, and it becomes the militant uh, um, arm of the movement. But it's not just a division between the suffragists and the suffragettes. There are schisms between both of those. There are many trade union organizations. It's a much richer tapestry, complicated story of, um, of differences of opinions as to how to do this. So <clears throat> if you were living here, right here, over 100 years ago, and you were thinking, how should we do this? How should we campaign? So it's about women, but how do we do this? How would you react? How would you decide based on questions such as the following? Do you say to yourself, let's just get some women the vote? Because bear in mind that at the time, only some men had the vote. Do you just give it to some women and then they will open it up to everybody else? Let, you know, get the more powerful, maybe the wealthier, maybe the older, maybe the more educated women, which is what happened. Or do you say, no, 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 this is about women as women. We can't start saying just some women, because if we do that, we're, we're giving, up, giving up on that very idea of women. And also then who campaigns? Is it just the richer women that campaign? Do you align yourself to other social causes? Do you look around you at what, what else is going on in the UK at the time? And do you say, okay, it's not just about women's rights, it's about social justice in other ways. Or do you just focus on women? And then do you just focus on the vote? Or do you say, you can't just look at the vote. It's interlinked with so many other issues. How do you campaign? Do you look around you at the um, different parties that are out there and you say, oh, which party is more likely to take women's uh, interests into account? Or do you say, sod it. None of them are going to prioritize women's interests. We have to do it separately. Do you make comments about the key events that are happening at the time, things like the challenge to empire and Irish home rule, or do you, again, have nothing to do with all of that? Do you say, this is about democracy, this is about power, look at how men have fought for power, how men have demanded power, and they've done, done it, you know, look at the history books, it's primarily a military campaign, a military campaign in which you obey the leader, that's how change happens. Or is it about democracy and voice, and therefore you should discuss, agree? What, what would the right approach be? And as women, do you say, we women do it differently? Or is there a double standard if you say women should do it differently and shouldn't be mil militant, shouldn't be military, shouldn't kill, the way men have killed for power here and around the world? How, how, how would you have done it? So you can see if you start to go into the questions that there's an inevitability almost of, around differences of opinion. So as soon as you have the solidarity, you have these divisions. And in my family, you had four key women. You had other people. You had um, Richard Pankhurst, Emily, well, you had, you had other people. But let me say that there are four key women that are the ones that people quote the most. So can you shout out the first names of these women? Just give me a name. Sylvia. Sylvia, I love the fact that you started with her. <laughs> Sylvia, my grandmother, okay. Who else? Uh, Emmeline, the mother. Christabel, the oldest daughter. There's one more. Adela. Adela. I love this audience. Great. Okay, so more than 100 years later, you know the first names of four women in one family. And isn't that fabulous? And I bet you anything that behind many of the single men or the single people in history that we tend to know about, there are many other in that family that have contributed to that story, but you don't know about them. But in this case... I don't know why, for a combination of reasons, maybe because of this sense of it happening in a home, maybe because it's a, at that point it's a widow, a mother, and her three key daughters, her three eldest daughters who get involved. For whatever reason, we know the four first names of this, these women in one family. I also think that it's fascinating that they're all four buried in different continents. And that is telling of the differences and the schisms amongst them. So Emmeline is buried in the UK, Christabel in the States, Sylvia in Ethiopia, Adela in Australia. You know, how far can you take your disagreements if you end up in different continents? <laughs> and, they ha and they differed on many of the things I've just mentioned. Uh, complicated story. Um, but let me come back to a general statement, and then I, I'm wanting, I want to open it up and not talk at you too much. So the first point I made was solidarity, the second is difference. The third I'd like to make is that 
in the way that we think about it and in the way that it happened, it wasn't just about legal or structural change or policy change. This wasn't just about the vote, the right to vote, that act in Parliament. Change happens through that structural aspect, but it happens primarily for two other reasons. Firstly, it happens because of the agency of individuals, individual people thinking that they can make a difference, that they don't want to accept the way society is saying that this is who they are. So change happens through the actions of individual people. It, it has in the past, it continues to happen. And then it also happens through change in social norms, in cultural views and traditions, in the ideas of what society says should happen. And it's the combination between agency, social norms change, and structural change that this is all about. And in particular, I would say, in terms of the suffragettes, it's the social norms change and the agency change that they achieved. So just a few quotes to, to, to elucidate that or to speak to it. First, from Noor al-Safar, a 14-year-old girl in Manchester who said, the Pankhurst legacy means I'm not afraid to have ambitions, not stupid to dream, not deluded for wanting to transform the world in which we live. <coughs> they taught me if they can make it possible, I can make it possible. And that's the power of an individual influencing people, not just then, but even now, with that sense of agency, individual power. And then this from Lady Rhonda, who was... Um, campaigning at the time, and she said, the vote was really a symbol, and the militant fight itself did more to change the status of women, because it did more to alter our own opinion of ourselves than ever the vote did. In actual fact, in those years, we were changing the attitude of a country, nay, of the world. That was infinitely worth the doing. Alter a nation's habit of mind, and the laws will alter themselves. Um, the last point I'd like to make is just to give you a little bit of a flavour as to what they got up to. Um, if we can find it. And, um, and so then I'm going to open it up to any questions that you have. So if you want to start thinking, there'll be two roving mics. Any questions about the suffragette, suffrage, difference of opinions, um, the film, anything like that. Not about how far we've got since then, because we'll do that in the next bit. But just to give you a bit of a flavour of what the suffragettes got up to, I say in the book that a final reason for why we're particularly interested in the suffragettes is in the sometimes colourless and drab roll call of history. The suffragette showed panache and humour using symbolism and merchandising, everything from cups and saucers to games, jewellery and clothes. They took politics from the tea room to the streets to the hustings, to wherever they could. They protested at theatres and cinemas. Holiday campaigns took place from the Isle of Man to the Kent coast. Women interrupted church services to pray for the hunger strikers and were violently ejected for their daring. Other tactics included a boycott of the 1911 census, with women hiding or partying away from home. Many refused to fill in the census or commented on the form, no vote, no census. Or, if I'm intelligent enough to fill in the census form, I could surely put an X on a ballot form. <laughs> um, and these census, there's a whole um, set of um, columns, and the last one has disability on it. So, of course, some people put not enfranchised under the disability bit. In general, male bastions of privilege were favoured targets for militant action. An official at the Tunbridge Wells Cricket Pavilion unwisely quipped, it's not true that women are banned from the pavilion. Who do you think makes the tea? <laughs> Ooh, indeed, the suffragettes responded by burning it down. <laughs> um, I'm going to circulate uh, one other kind of um, indication of what they got up to, uh, which is this is a one penny coin with the image of the king in front of it, and they've embossed votes for women on it. Just a lovely way of passing on your message in a very inappropriate uh, way. I'll pass it around. Could we just make sure it comes back to me at the end? OK, so anybody got any questions? Yes, here. Just uh, keep your hands up, thank you. <laughs> I found out recently about Elizabeth Wollstone-Hume and the role that she played prior to the suffragettes. Well, how do you see her role? Um, so she and many others um, were campaigning a long time before the suffragettes. So we have 50 years and more. I mean, you could, we could go even earlier. Um, and the, uh, so 50 years... 
I forget, I used to know the figure offhand of the number of petitions that were involved before. Um, and I think that, uh, that the power of different types of approaches to the campaign is really important. The question, in a way, is why has everybody else been slightly marginalised? Why have the suffragettes gained this kind of cultural power that means that it's almost silenced so many other people, including Elizabeth, including um, Millicent, less so now because there's been the statue, um, and also including people like uh, Mary Wollstonecroft, who was already you know, campaigning on issues of women's uh, voice and... Uh, power uh, well before. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the power of PR and communications and um, the imagery that they used. Um, so not to say one was more important than the other, the power of different, different approaches to it and it's the combined story that achieves things. And there are big questions around, you know, what would have happened if you hadn't had the militant action? What would have happened if you hadn't had the war? Um, would we have got the vote sooner or later? Um, no, no, I mean, I have my views on it, but I think it's, um, it's an interesting question. Do you have a particular view on her contribution that you'd like to share? I was just surprised at the... Can we get the... I was just really surprised of how ahead of her time she yeah. was. Um, you know, um, having a younger partner and a child out of marriage and then getting married later, um, and, and partly in order to, to keep some of her autonomy. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I was when you just mentioned then about the, the type of struggle, it brought to mind the Extinction Rebellion now yeah. and, and the, the methods that they're using or having to use in order to bring something that's yeah. important to the attention of... Westminster. Yeah. Um, so two points on that. Firstly, I think one of the saddest things about history is that we simplify and therefore exacerbates the problem that was there in the first place. So the invisibility of women has been even more uh, exacerbated, has been even has been invisibilized even more because some of the stories we don't even know about. Um, and the second point on Extinction Rebellion is they very much have taken some of the lessons um, from the suffragettes there. They kind of looked very carefully at, at that campaigning. Um, and the interesting thing for me on that is that I think we think about the suffragettes as a militant action. We do a disservice to what they did if we think that they were only militant. They were lateral thinkers. They were... Um, they were very clever in terms of using very, very different tactics um, and having different voices and different people leading on different ideas. The militancy came because of the government's, this liberal government's inability to shift. Um, the, 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 a few dinosaurs, literally a few dinosaurs in Parliament refusing to, 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 to shift. Um, and, and then you get a cascade, you get government, you get a ratcheting up of violence, the state, the suffragettes, the state, the suffragettes. But there were many, many other things, and I think it's really important, because there's, again, there's a richness that we forget if we just think, oh, they were, you know, they were bombing, they were throwing stones and um, bombing pillar boxes. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the second bit, which is how far have we got uh, in the last hundred years. And the first chapter looks at politics. Um, and there's a lot that we could say there. There's a lot that we could just tear our hair out with and just feel really depressed about. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to do this one very quickly as a chapter. But just to say that in terms of uh, issues around uh, gender representation in terms of women's representation, there's still a lot to do. It's what, 32% in the House of Commons, 29 in the House of Lords. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the issues around what, how women feel in that space and how they were treated, um, how about this from uh, Lord Ferrers in 1957 saying, why should we encourage women to eat their way like acid into metal? into positions of trust and responsibility, like acid into metal. If we allow women in the house, where will this emancipation end? <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so the way that they, they were treated, the way that they were felt, they felt, um, in this chapter I look at politics in the wider sense, also looking at the legislature and the number of barristers who said something 
like this, and this was said by actually a solicitor, but she said, when I first started here, I had a real feeling of being an imposter. I laugh about it now, but at the time, I literally used to die a little inside every time someone spoke to me. And it does come back to me every now and again. For example, if I go to a meeting and there are very few women and all the men seem to know each other, I have to tell myself I am supposed to be in there and that people aren't looking at me wondering if I've walked into the wrong room by mistake. So that sense that the that Parliament, that the political establishment is still man-made, not just in terms of representation, but also in terms of the conversations, the issues, the policies, that we don't have two lenses on things, something that you know, politicians still feel uh, is very much the case. And then we've got the fundamental issue that uh, the relationship between <coughs> us as citizens and the political establishment is mediated by the media. And how gender neutral is this media? You know, in particular, when it's about talking about feminism. So, um, for example, the Good Parliament report was commissioned and, um, and publicised in 2016 um, when the media zoned in on a sub-point of one of the recommendations. So they zoned in on breastfeeding. So that all the media reports, even the serious media, it was about this breastfeeding point. Um, it had been a sub-point of, I think it was 43 recommendations. And the main point was that there was a need for policy on maternity, paternity, adoption, and care leave. As Joe Swinson commented, it's a journalistic equivalent of pinging a girl's bra strap and thinking it's hilarious. Boobs, they mentioned boobs. So, you know, how far have we got in terms of politics if there's still that attitude? So, um, on this one, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get your uh, figures, and I'll do it as follows. So if you think on, in politics, in the UK, there's been no change, and we are where we were 100 years ago, if you can put your fist up like that. If you think we've got equality, if you could put five, and if it's somewhere in between one, two, three, four, let me see what you're scoring, and then I'll say what I'm seeing around me as the dominant. So if you all do it, every single one of you, your own thoughts. So I'm seeing twos, threes, twos, threes, the odd four, um, okay, if you've got a one or a four, could you keep your fingers up? Okay, so basically it's between two and, f and fours, but it's primarily between twos and threes that you're scoring for this chapter. So what you're collectively saying is that we've moved forward, but there's still work to be done. I'm going to move on to a more interesting chapter because otherwise we'll just get lost in, in that stuff. Um, so what about economics? So what about in terms of women's sense of um, their financial autonomy, their careers and so on? So the first thing to say about this is that women have always worked, and I'm talking about paid work now. I'll talk about unpaid work later on. But in terms of paid work, throughout the 100 years, women have always been involved in paid work. It's just if you start from the beginning um, and right through to the present, they're involved in things that are not counted, not valued, not given, given low status. So they used to talk about women in the five Cs, which are... Childcare, cleaning, cleaning <laughs> cooking, cashiering and clerking, low value. For some reason, banking is really important, gets a lot of money, but caring is not important, gets very little money. The whole kind of economic structures of society still reflecting those differences in prioritisation. Um, but what starts to happen, well, you know, first you, you've got the First World War and um, women brought into all sorts of activities that they couldn't do before and then told to go back when the men come back. Same happens in Second World War, whole um, opportunities in terms of all sorts of careers women were not allowed before. They're back in and then back out again. During this time, fantastic creche and nursery opportunities are provided they disappear after each moment, slightly less so after the Second World War because there's a labour shortage at that point. But generally, when it's required, when for other reasons, not gendered reasons, when for other reasons creches are required, just at that point I see a little child at the back, which is wonderful to see, with his father, I think. Um, um, you know, that there's, there's a, they're double standard. So another example of double standard, uh, you, have the, um, fam you have the marriage bar. So at, at certain points, uh, married women are not allowed to work, certain professions. However, if you're a clean owner cook, you can be married and you can continue working, no problem. And also, if you're important enough, for example, this was happening at the BBC, cleaners, cooks continued, middle career women were not allowed when the marriage bar was operative. If you were important enough, letters get lit written and you were able to work. So double standards around the idea of women and work and when they're allowed to work. Um, things start to change uh, significantly uh, with uh, education, free education, to the age of 12, 14, 16, more and more women being brought into the, uh, more 
opportunities in terms of careers. But then there was always the issue of what they were encouraged to study. So this from Liz. I wasn't allowed to take chemistry O-level. I was told that I had to do needlework instead. I'm proud of my U, unclassified, gained at the end of the course. In the written paper, I was asked, your husband is going on a business trip. What do you pack for him? <laughs> my answer, I don't, he does it himself. I wasn't trying to be clever, it just had no connection with my life. My dad was an electrician, when would he ever go on a business trip? I was meant to say that I would pack his socks in his shoes, which would be at the bottom of the suitcase. This was in 1981. Oh. I'm very proud of my younger self, says Liz. Okay, and then how about this? So um, this is from Judith Gillespie. The quotes, by the way, are a combination of people that I met as I was doing the research, some very famous, some that, that, that you wouldn't know of. This is Judith Gillespie, who was the Deputy Chief Constable of the Police Service in Northern Ireland. And she said, given the terrorist threat in Northern Ireland, from the early 70s, male officers were issued with both a personal protection firearm and a baton. Female officers were issued with a handbag. <laughs> Female officers weren't routinely armed until 1994, ironically the same year as the first IRA ceasefire. Um, we could talk about um, pay gaps. In 1970s, so much work done in terms of... Uh, trying to go for change in legislation, and then very recently through the gender pay gap reporting, uh, 2017, 2018, we've seen how much still needs to be done. Keele University, anybody got an idea about what the um, pay gap, the gender pay gap is? I've seen one hand, anybody else know? Put your hands up if you know, firstly, I'm just interested to see how many people know. So about three people putting their hands up. Okay, so one of you, you put your hand up straight there. Can we have the speaker, uh, the, the mic, sorry, hang on a sec. It's around the 30% and it's one of the worst in the country, is what I know. <laughs> in terms of universities? In terms of universities, Okay, yeah. does anybody from the university want to challenge that figure? <laughs> so I think, it, I think I saw a 27% for the median and an 18% for the mean, but I might be wrong. You think that, that's correct? That's, that's what we think here, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so it is still one of the worst in universities that, that I could see. Um, so just putting it out there, <laughs> um, that there's work to be done. And I am convinced that all of you working in other institutions near, you know, around here, not just the university, would find that if you looked at the gender pay gap reports of your organisations, you'd be shocked at how high it is. And the point is that that information is power. That information should be used to say... Honestly, it's the 21st century, how long do we have to wait? Um, that's all of that is about pay. What happens if we look at you know, things like um, the whole issue about um, uh, pregnancy-related uh, pay discrimination, if we look at issues around pension, if we look at issues around wealth? So this from Susan. My mother left Ireland to get away on ha where from how unfairly she was treated as a woman. Her five brothers inherited or were bought farm on marriage. My mother was given nothing and often said she couldn't leave my dad if she wanted to, as she had nothing in her own name, even although she worked her fingers to the bone. Margaret Thatcher, when she was prime minister, could not have taken a mortgage from a bank in her own name without the signature of her husband. Likewise for higher purchase. Um, the story repeats, says Susan, my younger brother inherited the farm, even although he'd lived away from, um, in Spain for many years, his seven older sisters inherited nothing. This was in 2012. So my question is, how far have we got in terms of uh, issues around economics, pay, and so on? If you think about your own families, I mean, in some ways, there is no doubt that there is massive progress. If you look at the women in your own families, the opportunities of careers, there, there's some fabulous storylines. But underneath it, there's also a continuity that keeps on reverberating in ways that I feel are still very, very present. And also, really interestingly, if you look at the comparison between the 2017 and 2018 gender pay gap reporting, 
many, many companies are doing worse or the same. Very few are doing significantly better. Keele University is doing slightly better between the two uh, data. Okay, let's go for a vote first and then um, see if there are any comments or any anecdotes that you'd like to share from the audience. So zeros, five, in terms of economic change in the UK, what are your thoughts? Two, three, four, what are we thinking? So I'm seeing threes, twos, twos, threes. I sense slightly lower threes, twos, okay. If you do have a one or a four, the odd ones, okay. Any fours? No. Okay, so... Anybody who scored a one or three want to share, or I mean anything actually, but anybody want to share why they're scoring what they're scoring? And any anecdote that comes to mind? Yes, right here in front. Um, well, uh, my mother had to stop work when she got married. Uh, she was much, much brighter than my dad, much more ambitious than my dad. And if I hadn't been for the Second World War, she would have gone to university but she chose to go into the service and said, but she had to stop working because she was a, a secretary and she couldn't work as a married woman. And she was born at a time when women didn't have the vote. She had to give up her job because she was married. I, I haven't had to, had to do, do that. that. Yeah. And I think that's quite significant, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, some of the um, people who, um, some of the large employers, like um, the church and the post office, I think it is, um, yeah had a system whereby when you got married, you were given what they called a dowry. Does anybody know about this? So they were given a bride, pres a present for getting married. And the thing is, if you looked at the economic implication of that, what it did is it reduced their pensions. I don't exactly understand, but basically it was a present and then a pension wasn't given. And it was an economic cost to those people who took it. There's been some studies around it. Um, okay, anybody else want to, yeah. The uh, attitude that um, I first came to my mind uh, at the beginning of this section was um, why, how, h who felt about these things. And the consideration I had was, was that the men at that time, and look at my, um, at my age first of all, the men at that time probably felt threatened, basically. Uh, and that perhaps they also worried that if they encouraged or supported the women folk, uh, that they would find that um, they were being themselves uh, excluded or, or looked down upon with the same kind of attitude that had, when you mentioned the, uh, when you mentioned the Irish Home Rule, yeah. the, the same kind of attitude you would have got if you had supported Irish Home yeah. Rule. Yeah. That was the feeling with it within my family as, as I grew up. When I came to early adulthood, uh, I uh, had a girlfriend that got married, I was proud of the fact that I was the head of the family and she didn't need to work. <laughs> that was the attitude there was. Now, I know now a, a, a lot better, but that was the whole feeling of the attitude. And it was one, of, I think, more of responsibility rather than condemnation uh, of, of, of women for being what they were. You felt that you had the responsibility to be the head of the household, to protect uh, a woman. I still, if I'm working along the pavement, walk on the outside, for instance. Um, <laughs> And that was, as I said, my, yeah. my, my upbringing and how, how this kind of thing arose. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, just an anecdote to share from when I first started at Kiel. I remember being at an induction event and I was talking to um, a female lecturer in psychology. And her husband worked as a, uh, her husband was an officer in the British Army. I remember she said that she had just had to fill in a form where she was asked to comment on what her supporting role was for the regiment. Uh, and there was, there was no comprehension, there was nothing within the form that had any kind of its suggestion that she could have an independent career whatsoever. Yeah. And yeah. That, so that's within the, you know, the, that's, that's with, you know, since 2000. Yeah, thank you. There was a question just here, or point. I voted um, a three because I think that women have more access to a greater number of professions. But it's only a three because I don't think it's any easier for those women once they are in those professions. And I speak for, uh, um, you know, with experience, um, we fight, still fight many, many battles. So it's, I'm, I'm not sure really. I think it's quite tokenistic in a way that... The, the access we've got, because you still 
up against um, patriarchy. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll move us on to the next uh, chapter, which looks at the issue of women's identity. And um, I, I, I'll come back to something that's linked to that at the right point. But when, when, you, when I started to look at this issue, so the next area, I was thinking I was going to... Um, everything was going to be a lot more positive because we got more sexual reproductive rights. So women's sense of identity, their choices, their sense of whether they want to have children or not, to get married or not, what order between marriage and children, or what their sexuality is, what their work is. So many more different arcs now in terms of how women are and how they live their lives than was the case before. So in many ways, um, lots of positives that one could say. Um, and then there's issues around things like uh, the relationship between women and their families. So the first point here, um, a quote from Annie. Annie said, my aim is to raise my children to be happy and healthy. Yes, it's not very equal to be home whilst my husband is working, but it's what I want. Maybe I've been conditioned that way after seeing my mother and grandmother do the same, but I have also seen the successes that they achieved and their quiet power. They are my heroes. I'd like to follow in their footsteps. And this speaks a little bit to the point that you were making earlier on, which is this sense that in the past we had a sense that men were the breadwinners, that that was their role, and women stayed at home and looked after children. A couple of things around that. Firstly, well, lots of things around that, but firstly, not all women would have wanted that. Secondly, that that role, for economic reasons, is less and less likely to be possible with the need for two incomes to come into households. Um, and secondly, as a consequence, or maybe on thirdly, as a consequence, it's been very much devalued. So even for those women who want to do that, it's no longer something that, uh, that, is, that society kind of looks, um, looks, looks at positively. Um, but then the issue of the complexity of the, for those who try and do, do it all. So this from Anne. Somewhere around that time, I started to slip into a rather undefined world where I became less of an individual and more support to others. I was there for my husband, for my children, and for my ageing parents. And whilst this evolving, kinder, more caring persona developed, another side of me lost definition and direction. So the story there, I think, is that um, women are having to shoulder a lot of the emotional uh, roles that they are, and this is pivotal, they're at the core of families, they are the emotional centre of families still, um, and therefore we have this dichotomy between women uh, and their relationship with their families affecting all of their work, because this is at the core of who they are as they identify themselves, as others identify them. No women... Um, meet each other and don't very, very quickly talk about their family. It's just, it's in our, in the way that we communicate. So I'm saying that because I don't think it's an external thing. I think it's also an internal thing. And by contrast, the way society talks about men and the way men see, see, see themselves is slightly aloof from that. So they di define themselves more in terms of work and therefore there's less of that emotional connection with their families with all the costs that that are implied in that. The most important people to men, they are slightly more aloof from. The most important people for women, they are more connected to. The, 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 somebody said to me that the way even we define love is gendered. Women define love in terms of giving, men define love in terms of receiving. I'm simplifying it, but I think in many ways we have still a dichotomy between the way that society looks at and defines men and the way that looks, um, society looks at and defines women. Women as relational to their family, men as autonomous from their family. I'm not saying it's universal, I'm just saying that's still the predominant norm. And remember when I started off, I talked about in terms of the suffragette movement that there's this issue of agency and social norms and structural change. Norms are so powerful. They, per they, they perpetuate things in so many ways. Um, the other, uh, so, so, so my, one of the concerns I have is I think this isn't budging as quickly as it should. Um, another uh, worry uh, I've had, and it's been, it's increased over time. So I wrote this book, this is actually the hardback that I'm quoting from, and I revised it, um, and the, so this came out in February uh, um, 2018, and in March 2019 there's a soft copy, and I think it's the paperback that's out there. Um, and 
I revised downwards my figure for my um, score for this chapter, for this chapter on identity. And the main reason I did it was partly I kept on hearing the point I've just made. And secondly, it's the issue that it's still what women look like, what girls look like, and what men and boys do and say that gets perpetuated all the time. And with these mobiles of ours and the very young girls, you know, using them, looking at them all the time, the, the image focus of our society means that the message is perpetuated all the time, that it's what girls look like, the films that you watch, the TV that you look at, the books that you read, the music that you listen to, the advertisements, all the time. If you start looking at the entry point, it's what women look like, what girls look like, what even very young girls look like, seven-year-old girls who know how to pout, who pout when the camera comes close to them. Um, Eight-year-old girls who are worried about their hair showing and um, just the, the number of anecdotes that um, people have shared with me. So for me, a major concern, that unless we address this, unless everybody, it's what we look like, what we say, what we do, all of it, we can't have this dif difference. And then some audiences have said to me, yes, accept that there's a difference, but the main problem is that also young boys are now infected with this issue about what they look like. So instead of it being you know, more relaxed about all of it and valuing everything, we're, we, we seem to be going in the wrong direction. Um, let me just share with you a couple of quotes and then opening, open it up to you. So this from Elizabeth who said, before I started chemotherapy, I was sent off to choose a wig. I surprised myself by choosing a long, luscious brunette wig, nothing like my scruffy, short, undyed grey hair. A little later, I joined a makeup tutorial in a cancer group meeting set up to feel like a pamper party and I came away with a bag full of free lipstick, eyeshadow, foundation and blusher. Of course, I didn't have to do these things, but they seemed to be the norm, and somehow I felt that doing them made me more acceptable, a good breast cancer patient. So just to say that it isn't um, only the very young, that that issue about what you look like is in, in so many different spaces. And then the last quote, um, this from Lynn. I'm now 45. All my boyfriends have asked me to remove my pubic hair which shows the entitlement that some men feel they have with regard to the female body. The only difference is that men over the last five to 10 years have asked much sooner than they used to, which I think ties in with their increased exposure to online porn as opposed to the mags of before. I've always said no categorically without hesitation. It's my body, not theirs. But a concern that lots of people have reflected back to me on this. And actually, let me just say one last point, which is that you know, I've, I've in, in here, in the way I'm speaking, I'm sometimes saying men versus women. And, you know, fundamentally, this never has been, and even if you start off with the suffragettes, it's never been a fight between men and women. It's a fight between those who believe in traditional ideas of hierarchy and entitlement. And that can be around gender, it can be around colour, it can be around sexuality, it can be all sorts of things. So it's those who believe in those hierarchies and those stayed, you do this and I do that, and you're this and you're that, and this is more powerful, and this is more important, versus those who believe in the equality of opportunity and that actually any individual should be allowed to be whatever they want to be and whatever their circumstances can allow them to be. And men and women can be on either side of this. And in fact, if you go back to the suffragettes, the suffrage, the anti-suffrage league was headed by a woman and many, many men were in support of the suffragettes and the suffragists. So just to say that, you know, as we're talking about this, we're talking about the social norms that say men behave in certain way, women behave in certain way. Let's go for your score. Um, so... Uh, again, we're, we're looking at this area of women's identity, so it's, it's around issues of body, how society looks at women um, that we're looking at. Um, again, between zero and five, what are your thoughts? Um, twos, threes, twos, 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 ones, threes, ones at the backs. I'm sensing quite a few ones, actually. Um, I'm sensing you're probably, like me, scoring slightly lower on this. In fact, I think we're going down. Roughly three, roughly two, roughly one. Oops, we need to... Um, thoughts, uh, anecdotes, um, anybody want to share? Okay, right down at the back there. I find it immensely frustrating. I, I don't know who I am or what my place is in the world. I'm a mother, I'm a full-time teacher, I'm a counsellor, and I feel that I, I can't do it all and I don't understand... 
understand what my role is in the world and how I'm defined anymore. And I, I feel like the world expects you to do it all, but when your children are poorly uh, and you've got things to do at home, you can't do it all. So, for example, my husband's a firefighter, and it's not him taking the time off work, it's me taking the time off work. But what makes my role... Uh, in terms of my workplace any any worse than him I just feel really frustrated presently because I'm expected to do it all and that's what my thoughts are yeah thanks for sharing and I think your frustration comes out loud, loud and clear <laughs> yes are there quite a few it works both ways actually my Husband is the main carer in our family when it comes to this illness. He takes more time off. And he has been challenged at work to say, why are you taking this time off to do this? And he says, you wouldn't challenge that if I was a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Let's take one more, because um, I think there was another hand that was up. Yes, just here. And then I'm going to have to move us on. I mean, you talked about the having equal opportunity and... I'm going to refer back to the first chapter that you talked about, about the solicitor who didn't believe that she belonged. And I think that one of women's identities is really undermined by our lack of self-belief that we are worthwhile and that we have a place in some of the, the places that we really ought, you know, have a, a, an opportunity to make a massive contribution towards. Yeah. Um, so it's really this imposter syndrome that yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. and I think that's a thing that's holding women back as well. The agency, the individual actions that are important in changing some of that. Okay, we've only got about six minutes left, if I'm going to stick to time. So um, what I'd like to do is, th there, there's so much more we could talk about. We haven't talked about violence. We haven't talked about uh, culture, changes in culture. Um, you know, football, there's so many things that we could talk about, or power. Uh, but I'm going to shift us right through to, so now what? If we assume that um, generally you're likely to be scoring something like what you've scored now, there's nobody scored a five. We're not there yet. If you disaggregate it, you'll find that there are different areas um, where we still have a lot more to do. I wondered whether if you have a lower score, that means that's what we should be doing more on. Um, and that was partly why I started... Um, you know, that, 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 that was why I was scoring each chapter. I've actually come to the conclusion that I, I think that's wrong. I think that we all can make a difference in our own spaces um, in terms of the way that we respond to society, the way that we respond to those around us um, in, in our homes, in our workspaces. Um, and then there's the issue of changing social norms. If enough of us do that, we change social norms. And then there's the issue of campaigning for structural change. And that can be on any particular issue. So... Um, let me share with you some of my favourite quotes that people have said in terms of what they think uh, should be done, and then I'll give you just a few minutes to talk amongst yourselves and then pick up the points at the end. So, um, Joe, colleague of mine at Care International, we do a lot of things together around International Women's Day, for example. She suggests that all photoshopped images, just like cigarette packages, have a sign saying, this damages your health, that all photoshopped images should have that. Somebody in the audience worked at the BBC and she said, you know how we pay licence fees? Well, how about you women who are paying the licence fee pay only half what men pay, since women journalists only get half what um, men journalists get? Um, in another place, uh, several times, children, youngsters, have brought up the issue of pockets. The fact that boys have pockets and girls don't have pockets and symbolically what on earth is it telling these youngsters and then all of that lots of nods to the pocket issue um, somebody has said whenever there's an audience around uh, women's rights issues and this is replicated here it's mainly women that come and you know maybe when whenever you go to a feminist something that's about women's rights Make sure you go with men, you know, bring your brothers, husbands, whatever. Let's have a wider conversation so we have the different voices. And I think that's, that's really important. And somebody else said, yes, but make sure that they're also in learning mode. Um, because otherwise, for many reasons, including the imposter uh, reasons there, women tend to be more silent. They tend to be more uh, in listening mode. Um, and it's really important that we hear men, women's voices in all of this. Um, just a few examples, but I think uh, maybe turn to your neighbour, think about what you think the priorities are, um, and then let's just pick up a few points um, at the end. So we've got about two minutes. Just make sure nobody's on their own as well. So do clusters. That...
So um, a great hubbub there. Um, anybody like to? Anybody got a solution that they'd like to share? There's a hand that shot up there. Um, we were talking about young, well, my daughter. My daughter's 12. Um, she's just started in year seven um, at high school. Um, and all of her friends fit inside a box. Um, all of her friends fit inside this very pristine, very immaculate box. Um, and my daughter has been brought up to not fit inside the box. She's been brought up to stand outside of it. Um, and we were discussing that it's conformity almost for children now mm -hmm. and for girls now that they feel like they've got to have the immaculate eyebrows. You've got to have the perfect hair and the perfect pout. Um, and it isn't like that. You shouldn't be afraid to take the box, basically, and shove it somewhere. Um, <laughs> and that's what I've taught my daughter. And hopefully that's what she'll be like. <laughs> Yeah, fabulous. Um, I think that will be one of the takeaways of the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, there are um, lots of hands going up here, just there. And I think as a teacher, I think when we have these conversations with young girls and young boys, starting at a young age, it has to be the thing, like, if, if your daughter says to you, Mum, all the, all the girls at school do their eyebrows. It's having the conversation, well, do, do, you, want, do you want to do your eyebrows? And it, it's, it's about them empowering in their choices. Because we, we, can't, we can't make young girls afraid or young boys afraid to, to be who they physically want to be in their image, in their projection, in their education, in their future. And I think if we, if we equally pigeonhole the people that w want the nice eyebrows or want to do things like that, what are we saying, why are we creating a them and us equally there? I don't feel there's anything wrong with, with, with being a pretty educated female. I don't think there's, I think we have to not pigeonhole women into them and us when it is about physical image and stuff. And I think Jamelia Jamil, if I pronounced her name correctly, yeah. I think she's a great empowerer of that because she does speak out against the photoshopped images and yet she is very happy wearing makeup and looking wonderful and putting the high heels on and wearing that beautiful dress with pockets. And I think, I think, I think, you, I think you can have both and have it all and, and equally make those empowered choices along the way. So, Thank you. Um, I guess it's also the question of um, having the choice, isn't it? I mean, is if you don't see, if you only see... Um, sorry, I just want to share with you one quote, because I just absolutely love it. Um, 260, where are we, Kennedy? We are 264. So this is from Helena Kennedy, um, who... Helena Kennedy, QC, as you know, very strong um, woman, uh, barrister... Um, represents all sorts of things. Either way, she said, I maintained a visceral pleasure in dressing up. I loved lipstick and mascara, high heels and push-up bras, nail polish and scent. No political movement was going to inhibit my desire to make life glamorous or my sensuous enjoyment of things that felt good, even if produced by corporate capitalism. Contradictions were the stuff of life. And I think that's the point. It's the contradictions that we should be allowing and, and not pigeonhole, uh, 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 pigeonholing people. And I think the problem is with girls, they're expected to be sporty, academic, beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just saying to them, you know, there are many options about who you are. Um, and, and the problem is the society is just telling you be a certain kind. Yes, there were a few other hands there. I just I think that at the moment, just as there is a climate emergency, I think there is an emergency around pornography as well. And I think the thing about identity has got worse. Mm. And I think there is an issue both for boys and for girls, for men and for women, where we're being driven further apart mm. because of pornography, because it's so much harder to meet together as real human beings. Yeah. And I think that's part of what you're talking yeah. about. If we can't be real human beings, we can't be ourselves. And I think that has really got to be tackled. Yeah. Um, there was a hand, yeah. I think I had a slightly more practical thing. So I, I right. work for a university. Uh, you may be able to guess which one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think there's very practical things that could be implemented to make uh, gender equality more real. Uh, so I am here this evening because I have a husband who is willing to look after our small child. Okay. I am expected to do an open day this weekend recruiting students. I am only able to do that because I have a husband who can look after our child. There's no institutional support for that sort of thing, that these roles that we are expected to perform. Obviously, there's lots of that sort of stuff. 
And uh, things like we don't have a central pot of money that pays for people to have maternity leave if they are pregnant. I've literally sat in a very awkward meeting where, where someone, uh, it was discussed whether there was money to cover them and whether basically they were important enough to be replaced during maternity leave. You know, these things should not happen. I think they really undermine women feeling valued and supported and being able to do the jobs that they, they want to do. Okay, so many more discussions. I'm seeing some shakes of heads in the, uh, by some people. So clearly there's a discussion that's required there that would be useful. I mean, I felt that in terms of uh, things like the, uh, the bonus, I, I think there is no justification whatsoever for bonus gaps uh, because that's something you can change like that. It just depends on how, what criteria you're, you're using to do the bonuses. Some of these other things are institutional. They might be difficult in terms of pay gap. But bonuses, quite frankly, there is no excuse for bonus changes, bonus inequality. I mean, it, it, that, that one just drives me nuts because there's absolutely no reason for it. Um, okay, any others? Any? Yes, great, at the back. Um, I got social media, things like Instagram, in the infancy of when they were created, and I'm sure there are lots of girls here who did too, young girls, where back in like 2013, 2014, it was all fun and games. You, you posted what you wanted to post. You didn't care how many likes you got on it. Like Your mates would comment if they wanted to. It wasn't a big deal how many people followed you. But it's turned into this horrible, horrible thing where you care how many likes you get on a photo. Like You, you, you feel bad if you don't get as many as you usually do. I, I've certainly felt that way when I've been a teenager, where like I would delete photos if they didn't get as many likes as I thought they were going to get. Um, and I feel like these influencers and these, these, these um, people who Photoshop all their pictures and who, who make other women feel a lot less than, but they, they don't know that they're doing that because they're just trying to achieve that image themselves. And it, it makes you think, you know, should these young girls who, I, I know my niece, she's 13, 14 years old, she's got an Instagram account. Um, should they be on Instagram? Should they be allowed to be on Instagram? Because it's, it's a really upsetting and toxic environment for young women and also young men at this stage. And it's whether we need regulations for um, like people. Like it's saying, I know at the top it now says if things are an advert or not, whether it, and there needs to be something like whether this has been edited, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's get, kind of getting out of hand, I think. Um, so I was... I think it was Hebden Bridge. I was somewhere where a secondary school, it was, 10th grade, it was a teacher of 10th graders, and she said that uh, what happened on the first day of class was that the boys asked for photos of the girls, which the girls gave, and then there was a ranking of how hot the girls were. The girls were complicit. So just to say, there is so much still that needs to be done. I think, I think things morph. You know, they don't stay, they change, they, they morph. Um, one of my favourite quotes from the book is somebody who was um, um, a prison officer, as it happens, and she said that um, we, if you think about an elastic band and we're stretching the elastic band, we're changing views, we're changing social norms, and she said what we do is we think we've got there and we let go. And if you let go, the thing defaults back. And in fact, somebody, I've been sharing this analogy and people say not only does it go back, but it goes back with violence. It goes back, in fact, slightly further back. So we need to make sure that we keep doing it until we know that that elastic bracket's not going to stretch um, forwards, backwards, and we, we just have to keep going at it. Um, thanks for being a really engaged audience. There is so much that we can do individually. We are all complicit in this society, but we can all do a bit more, just as we have to on environmental issues, and the young people of this, um, the current generation is so on board with those issues, that we, we are involved, we must do more. Um, I wouldn't be my great-granddaughter's, great-grandmother's daughter if I didn't say, and vote, vote, vote. Thank you. <laughs>